What's up, guys? It is your favorite Nicolas Cage Savage, Supercliff, back with another podcast episode where we're going to talk about some cool shit. And my guest today is Chris, also known as Speedy, also known as Turtle at times. How are you doing, bud? Doing pretty good, man. Excited to be here. Nice, dude. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited for you to be here as well, virtually. Yeah, like I, it'd be amazing if we could do, uh, you know, a face to face, which. Yeah, the world's against us on that one. <laughs> we'll get there, though. One, one day. But yeah, and so we're basically going to talk about a movie that this movie is so like majestic in its own right. This thing, this event has never happened before. And so I guess we're just going to get right into it. We're going to talk about the Justice League Zack Snyder edition, uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League, which has a runtime of four hours and two minutes and a four by three aspect ratio with the soundtrack done by, uh, what's his name? Junkie XL, but his real name, um, Thomas Hockenberg is Junkie XL's real name. And so let's just talk about like um, what the Snyder Cut is, like real quick, like a real catch up phase. I'm like, how do we get here? What's going on? So Chris, do you want to maybe take us through this? I mean, realistically, it was the fans. It was the fans and what we wanted. <laughs> like the best thing, the best way to put it. It's like we asked and we got. And like you said, it's never been seen in Hollywood history. It's, a, it's just a phenomenon that happened. And like we're hoping for more out of it, obviously. Yeah. I mean, the best way to say that we got to it. Because the studio was nervous due to Batman or Superman not maybe performing as well in the box office, they were like, oh shit, let's try something else. And they used, unfortunately, they used the, the death of um, Zack Snyder's family member to kind of use that to, the, to their incentive to bring in Joss Whedon and essentially just kind of rework the whole Justice League movie to make it more like Marvel. And the problem with that is you can't do that when you're writing a story. You can't just change it halfway through. You got to kind of go all through it. Um, it's all about being consistent. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't take something like Zack Snyder's Justice League and mold it into something else. Like you, you can't do that with really anything. But yeah, that, that, Justice League, that Justice League movie came out in 2017 and no one liked it. <laughs> it was a piece of shit, to be honest. Well, I mean, yeah, you could say that. I, I, but I, I, as I'm a huge DC fan, as you know. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. And some of my favorite superheroes that I got to read on pages as, as a child were coming to life. I took it for the, from that aspect. And I honestly can't say I didn't like it in that for that uh, you know appeal it was uh, you know uh, somebody's vision taken and stripped of what it originally was and you know presented in a corporate fashion let's say you know like yeah. basically the, yeah, the, the studio had most of it and then they gave creative direction to somebody who didn't have the same vision so it was just I I don't like to use the term hack job, but unfortunately, it kind of was. And that's completely fine. I, I think it I think it 100 percent is that. I think it's definitely a neutered version of what we just got. Oh, um, it, it was it, it was basically like, uh, you know, here, deal with it, you know, screw if you don't like it. But we made a big enough stink. And I honestly, I know this is like maybe bad advice, but I think we should take <laughs> a hint from that. And anytime we have a serious problem. Yep. <laughs> Just, really just yell really loud. Yep. Maybe take exactly. our pants off at the same time. See what happens. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, basically this Snyder Cut. I, I don't even know if you would consider it a director's cut. I really, it's really just a new movie. I'm going to consider it a new movie. Yeah, like the Justice League movie that we saw, the whole stepping wolf thing, it, it's all the same. The result's the same. It's just, it's done so much better in this movie. And, you know, let's just get right into like our quick thoughts on the movie. And then we'll get into like, what was what was changed? What was different about it? You know, what stood out more? But yeah, I mean, what what are your quick thoughts? You know, regarding this Zack Snyder. So for, obviously, the uh, first thing let's start off with is the runtime. I personally, as much as I love to see a, a movie like portrayed as long as it can go, like Lord of the Rings did an amazing job with its length. You know, even Avengers Endgame was a long movie, but you know they did a good job. And I feel like this is where the injustice was done because it wasn't properly edited. And that's where, where I think it makes it, you know, a director's cut of the movie. And I'm not saying this movie was prop, it was improperly edited. I just feel like if, it, if they had originally allowed Zack Snyder to do his thing, 
it, we would have had a more complete, more fluid, shorter, but still informative movie. What I find interesting about this, this movie compared to like Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman, well, like for, for off the record, like let's just, you know, get this out of the way. I was never a fan of the Snyder DCU movies, whereas you were. Yeah, we, we had you, talked you, about that at work because yeah, I believe yeah. we worked together, you know, shortly yeah, we, after both those movies were either coming out or released. Or like the drama kind of like was hot at that time. And we would both have our different opinions and clearly we would talk about it like gentlemen, not like savages. Of um, course, yeah, <laughs> we are now. Yeah, <laughs> duh, duh. but, um, you know, I've never been a non-believer of, of the Snyder Cut. Like I, there's always a cut of a movie that's never published into the theater. It's like that for any movie or unfinished project, but it doesn't mean that it's a finished project. I think oh, a thing about the whole Snyder Cut hashtag thing was a lot of people viewed the Snyder Cut was like, it's a movie that's already done. And I think that was like the biggest miscommunication, I think within the fan base. And that's why I think it, a lot of times it, it became very uh, heated <laughs> in, on the internet. I, I agree with that because yeah. that's that, like, because a lot of people didn't realize that at the, like, uh, he left a half a movie, unfortunately, in a way he let like, if you, if you rewatch the movies, like I, I, I'm kind of ashamed, but not ashamed to say that I've watched uh, the new justice league at least five times. That's completely fine. <laughs> uh, and I've also watched the other justice league at least 10 times. I've fallen asleep to it most multiple times. It's just something I can put in the background because honestly, like I said, it's something yep. that warms my heart yep, and that's no. all it gets from me for praise. I'm sorry. <laughs> No one's going to take that away from you. <laughs> so anyway, to, to, to make a long story short here, um, he did what he had to do to finish an unfinished product. And that's the thing. It wasn't a finished product. Granted, there is what, about two hours plus more into the movie. They did add things that were already filmed for sure, which you can tell because yep. continuity issues. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also see that there's a point where, where the new director took over. Yeah. Yeah. Period. And so I guess like, you know, with the little backstory of like what the Santa cut is and the media surrounding it, let's, you know, let's just get right, you know, let's get right into it with the prologue, I guess. And it's like a nine minute prologue, I, I assume, where it's just ran screaming. And by the way, there's gonna be a lot of spoilers in this episode, guys. So if anyone who's watching this and you haven't seen it yet, spoilers. Uh, yeah, dig your head. <laughs> anyways, there is like a nine minute segment like intro of this movie, like where we just kind of get into it, which I appreciated because when I saw Batman vs Superman in theaters, I love that Metropolis scene with like Batman on the ground and seeing it from like his point of view. Mm -hmm. But my only problem with that beginning of that movie was when we see the death of the Waynes once more and mm -hmm. he gets like lifted into the sky by the bats. I thought that was like weird. And luckily we don't have an intro like that. Like we just kind of get into it. It's just Superman I literally stabbed. picks up from the best point to pick up from. Yeah. L literally. And because it, it, it makes sense, like the, the after credit scene, I believe it was, or the ending of Batman versus Superman, where Luther's in jail and he tells him a bell can't be unrung. He wasn't talking about the mother boxes dinging, wasn't talking anything about that. Like fans had speculated. He was talking about the fact that Superman's scream was so loud. It was heard across the universe. And, and that was such a moving scene for me. Yeah. So we get that, that screaming for 10 minutes and i actually liked it because you're you're getting different parts of the dc universe through that one scene like you're traveling with mascara where it wakes up the mother box you're, you're touching the mother box with cyborg touching the mother box in atlantis it's you're getting all these scenes and it's really kind of connecting the dc universe with that one screen which i thought was kind of really cool and, and again it brings us back to the bells have been rung thing yeah. like now now there's the reason to unite the seven now this movie's original tagline with people seeing the snyder cut can understand what that out originally meant yep but we'll get into more of that later because i have a few things to talk about when we get to it but yeah yeah and so basically that that is the intro of this movie the large the large screen and then we proceed to the first chapter which is don't count on it batman the introduction of aquaman into this universe and this scene was done so much better than the original one because Aquaman is like translating for these guys or whatever, these people who are kind of like Fisher people. And there's no stupid drawing of dark side or boxes. It's just because he already knows who Aquaman is. And I think yeah, he knows chapter, who he's looking for. That's the best part yeah. about that. But like, I will say the one, the one part of this 
segment I didn't, not that I didn't like, I just felt like it was kind of un- unnecessary, was when Aquaman takes his shirt off, leaves, and the girl takes the shirt, she starts singing. And like, it was cool, but then it went on for like five minutes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it doesn't murder my, my viewing experience. <laughs> No, not um, at all. Not at all. I, I, I do believe that maybe they could have cut that, like, you know, the singing back a little bit. And when they pan out to Martha uh, Kent, then they could have, you know, just kept on with the in the background sound. Yeah. Apparently, like, there's 10%. 10% of this movie is slow motion. And that's... I, 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 when I rewatched, I noticed that. And uh, it's all the perfect point, though. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's, it's style. Obviously, if this movie were to be, like, released as it would have been, that slow motion would have been reduced, <laughs> to say the least. And then we, is it like the bank, the bank scene? Or was that like the House of Parliament in England, wherever Wonder Woman uh, is? It's a, it's a bank, I believe, yeah. or, or something. Well, actually, it makes no sense to be a bank because... Why are kids that? Sure. Like, what is, is it a museum? Anyways, well, like, this scene was so much better done than, <laughs> like, the one in Justice League. Oh, it makes it, it makes so much more use of Wonder Woman's powers. It doesn't it doesn't like completely negate her super speed like it does in the 2017 version. It doesn't negate her ability to fly like it does in the 2017 version. But but like, it also it also gives us the amazing like the beginning of the soundtrack for this movie, which I think it's the, the soundtrack for this movie, though it's repeated a lot throughout, it's amazing and it's dope. And I use it when I work out because it's so crazy. Just she's kicking ass. She punches a dude, and he and his face lands against the the wall, and there's an imprint of blood on it. And you're just hearing the the Wonder Woman theme song, the woman sing in the background. It's so it's so metal. That's another thing that I loved because this movie was rated R compared to the other one being what yeah. PG thirteen, I believe, right? Yeah. The blood yeah. spatters. You see it with the scene where um, Steppenwolf throws the Atlantean and smashes his head up against the rock. Yeah, and, and he was still alive. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was still alive and not yeah. even like messed up. What I like about this scene as well is at the end of the scene, Wonder Woman is a hero. She's not just some tough, badass warrior who just murdered a bunch of terrorists and just kind of left. You know, she kind of inspires the girls there. That's a thing I really felt, for me personally, was lacking in the Batman vs. Superman and Man of Steel was that sense of inspiring. There was never like that moment where like, are you okay? They, they have that human connection with, yeah. you know, with the victims of these or like, you know, that like the, as their saviors. And it's part of why we love superheroes, man. It's yeah. because we know that they do the right thing because they have to. And uh, well, not even because they have to, because it's the right thing to do. It's because we suck and they're way better. <laughs> and that's <laughs> I agree, well, agree. Uh, but I digress. The next scene, I, is it when she visits Bruce? No, no, because the Femascara scene has to happen. Yes, Portal. that's right. The mascara okay. scene has, happens, and that's where we get the uh, Steppenwolf intro, I believe. Yeah, though that's where we get like the reintroduction. Well, not the reintroduction, but the um, uh, the re- the rebuilt Steppenwolf, I guess you can say the yes, the redrawn, whatever, the, the real Steppenwolf. And I will say this: the thing I appreciate about the original Steppenwolf was he was very his CGI was terrible, but his, he was very comic book oriented, very similar to the one in the comics in the, in the new Fifty Two. This one was clearly the armor wasn't, but it was sick. Oh, I loved it. I, I thought yeah. it was a great take on it due to the fact that he's an alien, man. Yeah, he's like, a new guy. Granted, yeah, he'll look anthropomorphic, but he's not going to look almost exactly human. So, and that's what I liked about it. And I like that they made, you know, his horns one piece and like it wasn't a helmet, you know? Yeah, it was very, it's, it was very much body armor. I mean, he does have, he, he gets those eyelids that like later, like with the blue lights and which I thought was also cool. I, I want to say nothing like, but about Steppenwolf. You really, you give a shit about him. I don't mean like you care about him as much as we care about Batman, but like there is more to him than just being like, I have a huge ax and I'm going to take over Earth. So that, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's a beautiful touch of Zack Snyder's, I'd like to say. And it's very hard for a director or even a, a comic book writer to make you sympathize in a way for the villain, even the slightest bit. Because you see that scene and you're like, oh, even somebody who knows as a comic book fan who knows yeah. why he's doing this. Yeah. You even say to yourself like, oh, man, dude just wants to go home, man. So something yeah. that's captured by Zack Snyder along this line is that it, it's a, a very good friend of mine told me once on a, in a comic, a very spirited comic book debate that obviously in a villain's eyes, they are the hero in their own story, right? But the main difference between a hero and a villain is, in, is the means in which they go about achieving their ultimate goal. It's not always the reason. 
It's the means, what they do. And that's what separates them realistically. And that's where you get, you know, the heroes wanting to stop the villain. I think what Seven Wolf does so well in this movie is really challenge our heroes. Where like in the original one, he just was there as a, as a bad guy. Where in this one, his actions, you know, especially when it comes to the character of Cyborg later on, they, he, he really challenges the heroes, which in turn transforms the team into, into a team. It's just such an amazing portrayal. Like, it's like literally the villain makes them realize we'll never do this alone. And you know what's cool? Because I'm just a big fan of the show. Do you know the show Rome on HBO? Have you ever watched it? I've never actually watched it. I've heard of it and I've heard amazing yeah. things. Well, the actor who plays Julius Caesar in it, that's the guy who plays Steppenwolf. Oh, uh, Kieran Hines. Yeah, I know. Who yeah, he, he is. plays. Um, he plays Mance Raider as well in Game of Thrones. I can never mm -hmm. pronounce his name, but yeah, he's an he's an amazing Julius Caesar, and you should definitely check out that show uh, because it's amazing. Following that, we get the um, Diana. I guess the arrow scene, which I thought was really cool. How uh, they just shoot an arrow, and there's, there's like a letter, and it's sent to a, like an, a specific location in Athens. And w Wonder Woman gets a call from it. Wonder Woman gets there, and this is where we kind of where she learns about Darkseid underneath that ruined temple or something. You know, when Wonder Woman visits Bruce Wayne, telling him that like, oh, people are already here invading. He didn't get Darkseid, just to he clarify. Just, yeah, yeah. Obsess, uh, or however you pronounce it, because he hasn't gained the Omega Sanction yet. So, but yeah. you see this world conquering army. It's the same, like I like to say with Thanos. And you see this uh, literally world conquering army, which is a very, 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 very tough opponent to deal with. And you then you not yeah. only see that, but you see what you see with Thanos, he's heading his own army. And that shows his bravado. It, it, it was amazing. And as like my two favorite superheroes being Green Lantern and um, Flash, not in that order, it's Flash Green Lantern. But anyway, um, seeing one of the first Earth Green Lanterns, his death was just absolutely amazing. Does that Green Lantern have a name? Is that like an actual uh, Green Lantern? Yulon, comics? Yulon, Yulon something, but um, I, I can't exactly remember what, uh, but it's some alien name. But cool. uh, he was followed up by Abin Sur, who was later followed up by yeah, yeah, yeah. Cal. Interesting Green Lantern scene, though, that I loved, that I loved in the original Justice League, and I'm very, very happy with Whedon for keeping it, even though it, it happened to Steppenwolf instead, was the yeah. scene where the lantern dies and the ring hesitates in front of both characters. Sense the willpower and realize that they would use it in the wrong manner and flee. I liked it how when Darkseid tried to grab it, he just got shot with an arrow instead. <laughs> yeah, and it stopped him, but like he, he wouldn't have grabbed it anyway. It would have outsped him. Like, But it, it's amazing to see that it, it portrayed something like that, meaning the base programming of the ring, the base yeah. programming of find the most willpower near it and you know attuned to it basically. We get those scenes where, like, after, like, Darkseid retreats, or you says, the Age of Heroes people, the, the, the Coalition, uh, they kind of remake the different boxes to, like, hide them. And I really love this scene. I love this for the wrong reason, though, because for the Atlanteans, they get, like, this octopus, and they, like, meld it and do some crazy shit with it. Amazons, they're, like, doing, like, hardcore godlike metal. And the, and the humans, we just kind of bury it in the backyard. Because we're just That's lazy like that. Just... I love that. It was so funny. Put this, I'm just putting the dirt. Meh. Then what happens next? <laughs> is it the Flash thing? Or is that, is that when Bruce is like, oh, we got to like recruit people now? They finish that up and they finish talking and like, you know, we got to find people and yada, yep. yada. Yep. And then it goes on to, um, I believe it's Flash. It could be, it could yep. be another. It's, it's Flash. I remember this because that's it, how it introduces, introduces the third chapter. And this is where we get Central City. And it doesn't start off with him at the prison. I thought this was really cool. He's applying to tons of different jobs, and he's doing them all at the same time because he's super fast. Duh. And he's using the money to be able to uh, get into a uh, criminal he's school. He's his way through college because he's already yeah. a college in a criminal justice major. Yeah. And I love it because he, he's so fast. He can literally do five jobs at the same time. We also get the introduction of Iris, who will, who will be in that um, upcoming Flashpoint movie. And... I thought this scene was really, really sweet where like it just stops and we just get we get the first scene of him tapping into the speed force. And at the end, he just grabs a hot dog and kind of gives it to the dogs. I thought that was really good. It was literally classic Flash. That's yeah. that was like including the hot dog thing. And people are taking that as like a serious joke. But that's something he would literally do. He yeah. can think at such high speeds. He's like, oh, but like, this is how they get back. Like in the Joss Whedon Justice League, he was so weird. He like he wasn't Barry Allen. He was just a weird guy. He's like an awkward uh, college student that had no idea how to be social. 
Yeah. And like, you know, Barry Allen, he's a nerd, but he's not like socially awkward, like creepy wise. And then we get the scene where they're at the prison with his dad. This was, again, this has done so much better than the previous one because there is a, a sense of organic love between the two. It doesn't feel forced at times. It's much, it's much more fluid and it really yeah. does like hit that, that, you know, you can tell Barry Allen's working towards something, you know, and then you can see that his father just wants his son to be in a, like, you know, forget about him. And like, that's classic Flash right there. This movie did serious justice to Flash. Like it really did. Yeah, because- this, this movie, because we'll get into Cyborg next, but this movie really stepped up the game for Flash, Cyborg, and Steppenwolf. I want to say Superman as well, because the mustache thing, it's just... Regardless or not, if he noticed it in the movie or not, it was everywhere on the internet. And so I really felt this was a great redeeming role moment for Henry Cavill, because I think he is a perfect Superman. I wish he was given more to do in the movies. Totally loved him as, as, as Superman. I, I thought he yeah. did an amazing job. Like we had talked about before, Man of Steel is one of my all-time favorite movies. Yeah. I wish that movie was a less darker in saturation, but you know, hey, and that's, that's what you get. But um, remember we get introduction to Cyborg. And this, and Cyborg is, I guess, our viewpoint on the team? I would say so, because at its heart, this movie is a Cyborg film. Yeah, it's definitely him coming into his own and, and becoming Cyborg. There is an animated DC movie that is on the same premise where they fight, just, uh, where they fight uh, Darkseid, and I believe it's Justice League... Uh, War. War, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I, this Justice League is definitely a adaption of the uh, the New Fifty Two arc, um, where they fight Darkseid instead of Steppenwolf. But like, it's the movie, so whatever. It's 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 literally the same thing. Little, little tweaks in there, but and then we get that Aquaman scene, same as same as before. Except the big difference here is Mira's British. Absolutely insane. Not something to hate because it kind of makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I get it. it. Like, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's just, it's more of an annoyance because you can always just forget about the the, the accent. Because sometimes I pretend things don't exist, like the new Star Wars movies. I don't think those exist at all. But like, I can understand the annoyance where other people are like, "Wasn't she like just speaking regular American in Aquaman?" Blah blah blah. And like, well, yeah. She also says her parents are dead and her father's alive. Yeah, her father is definitely alive in Aquaman because it's Dolph Lundgren. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I don't like about the Aquaman stuff in this movie is the fact that they use air bubbles to talk. I just think that's so, like, what's the point? I think that came up where, like, that was originally Zack Snyder's thing. So yeah. we think about it on the on the thought that James Wan had, James Wan was the one who directed Aquaman, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he came up with the idea of how it would work, and he just basically acted like there was that when Atlanteans talked underwater, there was no yeah. water. I just wish there was a better, and I think this is where the MCU does it a little bit better, where there's communication amongst the creators or the directors, so that there is a consistent flow. That goes back to the whole, like, you know, if yeah. they had stuck with it, man, like, you know, yeah. James Wan would have been like, oh, okay, so I have to do it this way. And the original Justice League mirrors American as well. I mean, the, the scene. The scene looks better. Isn't the um, Steppenwolf choking Mira added in? I think that was a new part to this to the scene. Yeah, that was new because she like uses the water magic, and this is something yeah. that showcased her her water magic too, which yep. was awesome. Yeah, she the blood and water out of him because yeah, know, it's liquid. That was really cool. And then the same response after like you know, them talking and like Aquaman's like, "Boom, oh, shirtless," and I don't like Atlantis, and she's like, "Well, you got to because Volkul." Oh yeah, and William Dafoe's in this movie too as Volkul. But he doesn't have the um the hair bun. He has long, long ru- unruly hair. I've been growing out my hair since 1955. Um, <laughs> but I think that's like where Aquaman's like, all right, maybe I should help out and not be like a loner. Then we get like the heroes kind of come together for that underground scene, like the tunnels. Where they're rescuing yeah, right. his dad, which I thought was a phenomenal scene. Them getting all together. And like, I think what really got me hyped up was when they're crossing the bridge. And like, you just hear the awesome music in the background. And yes. just for like, you know, for Flash, he uses the speed force to get across the bridge. One of them, she just jumps, Cyborg flies, and Batman glides. It's just like, no. God damn it. Like, that was so well done. It's simple shit like that where it makes the, mo- the movie so much better. Totally agree with that. Another thing, too, is um, the guy who plays Cyborg's dad, who's also oh. the scientist guy from Terminator 2, who creates. Oh, man, that, that, that's such an amazing thing. And I mean, it's probably going forward here, but can we just talk about his death real quick? 
Yeah. Um, so he goes into the, uh, the electron laser room and he sets it off and he presses a button and disintegrates an homage to his death in Terminator. Right. Yeah. Cause he got shot in the chest. Now remind me again, like why was it that he had to sacrifice himself? Like what? So earlier in the movie, uh, Choi and, um, when you oh, first yeah, meet Adam. Adam, Ryan Choi. Yep. And Tyler Stone is talking to him. They're talking about using the, the, the electron laser to superheat a metal. And yep. it becomes the hottest thing on the planet. Gotcha. So he shoots the mother box to superheat it and make it the hottest thing on the planet so that they can track it. He sacrifices himself to basically create a, a homing beacon. Got you. Gotcha. Okay. That, the actor in that role did a really good job on selling the father. Like the whole dynamic between him and Cyborg. Like, I gave a shit. It was really cool seeing. Yeah, yeah. You could see the investment in their characters. Yeah. There. And then I think it's after the scene where they where they kind of find out Cyborg has a mother box. Like, like, they find out more about him, I guess, like how he was built. And then they realize, oh, shit, we can just bring back Superman. And I think... Yeah, that's the scene where before they get into, like, the flying fox and Cyborg talks to it. Yeah. And I think that reveal when they were, like, a hologram of Superman flying was so cool. And they're all thinking the same thing. I love how they brought Superman back and the, the, the way they did the fight scene afterwards. Like, I also appreciate how Lois is involved in this movie because in the Justice League movie, Batman calls her to bring back Clark or like to calm him down. Whereas this, she's already there because she's been visiting his memorial site every day. Yeah, and they put that in the movie and that's super awesome. He's on Jimmy Olsen in the old Superman movie. That's right. Yep. I forget his name, but that's the guy. But that scene was really done because they, you know that's where he, you know, uh, saw out of stone dies, and I just, I just think that whole scene with Clark coming back to life and like Cyborg reacting the way that he did was so much better and much better understood because we get, we get a sense like why Cyborg's um, suit was kind of malfunctioning or whatever. Yeah. So then you realize because in the original it was like, okay, why is why is Cyborg perceiving him as a threat? And it's yeah. only you only get that notion because. When Cyborg and Steppenwolf meet, he tells them, oh, you were born of her, which was terrible. Yeah. And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> but yeah, in this movie, they definitely explain a lot of those parts. Superman gets brought back to life. He goes back to Smallville, you know, with Lois, and they're remembering stuff. And it's really well done. And I like the music that's playing in the background, the, the Man of Steel music, which I think is phenomenal. I think the Man of Steel soundtrack is really good. Oh, it was um, great. And I love how he chose the black suit. That was such a like an amazing moment because it, it shows a little bit more depth into Superman that you know and like we've got like we haven't gotten it and so many people wanted a sequel to Man of Steel. Yeah, and it shows like, honestly one of my favorite quotes from Man of Steel is when Jor El is telling Superman like what limits he can break. He tells him that you know the the house the symbol of the House of L is um, hope and everything, and he tells him that. And like, that's a very moving scene. And like, you, you hear the combination of Jonathan yeah. Kent and jor -El, and it's just such a moving scene. I love it. It's just my only critique, and this is not, I don't think this is Henry Cavill's fault because, you know, I've seen him act in other movies and he can act. I just wish Superman was given more to say, I guess, like more, more, more to say and what to react to. Like he does a good job overall. I just, I guess like, I just want that little bit extra. Oh, I'm Clark Kent and I'm a kind of a nerd. And I agree. It would have been great to have a little bit more super, uh, Superman dialogue because, yeah. you know, Superman. Justice League came in, it's Superman too. Yeah. You know, you got, some, you got to put some, like, something for him to say to someone. Yeah. I mean, granted, yeah, it was some great sappy stuff with Lois Lane, but... He stands stoically and he's like, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm built as hell. But, like, you know, Superman, he does talk. So, I mean, you know, that's my only critique with that character. But, yeah. And so then we get the Russian area, or is it Chernobyl? They, they never say it in the movie. They said it in they the don't original exactly one. They don't say it, but it's the but same it, it deal. It is Chernobyl. We're just going to say it's, it's, Chernobyl, it's Chernobyl because let's, Yeah, let's say big Chernobyl, yeah. Which I thought was a weird word choice to be like, oh, this is why we can camp here because it's toxic. But, but wait a minute. Think of it this way. Toxic because toxic to humans radiation-wise. Superman gets his ability from the sun's radiation. So what's to say that ap Apocalyptians wouldn't be able to resource something extremely volatile to us. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It's just, I'm just kind of making fun of the way he said toxic. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And then we get the fight scene. The way this final fight scene is done is leagues, pun intended, better 
than the final fight scene in the last Justice League. Because they're actually like working together as a team. Be- they've realized that it didn't really work the first time. So <laughs> now they're like, all right, we got to do this together this time. And now they're like, all right, yeah, we got this. Screw yep. you, man. And I will say this, like, I liked when Superman returned in the original Justice League. He's like, well, I know something about truth. And also know a little bit something about justice. I also like this version too, because he's just like, he just wait when Cyborg's about to get killed, he's there and he just blocks it on the shoulder because he's a he's a fucking Kryptonian. Yes, he's a man of steel. Right there, man. And this is where we get a really cool, I, I would say, culmination of Cyborg's character arc in this in this movie, where he finds out he's not broken. Because when he enters the unity, well, before before we get that, you know, I guess they end up losing. And so Flash decides to retrace time. Yeah. Flashpoint paradox. Yeah, and we also get that really cool shot of Superman lying down on the ground with Dark Side, kind of like the devil on the shoulder, which I thought was a really cool shot. Yeah, so that Cyborg, he he finally stops the Unity. They separate the boxes, and <laughs> fucking Steppenwolf's like, no, and there's a portal that's leading to apocalypse, and all of a sudden Superman just punches Steppenwolf in the face. Uh, Aquaman stabs him, or just cuts off his head and sends him back to Dark Side. And I, mean, I just thought that was an amazing. Because like, we don't need Seven Wolf for the second movie. He's boss round one. You know what I mean? We don't need this guy for future movies. They straight up said, "Here is your emissary." And then we get the closure of this movie, and, and instead of the Lois Lane narrating the ending, it's Salila Stone with the uh, recordings, much better worded and much more fluid. And then this is where we get to the what could have happened in the future of the DC Snyderverse. Was the, the epilogue. nightmare world? Yeah, everything else was cool. Honestly, I really love the conversation between Batman and Joker. It's fucking weird, but I just, I don't know why, but I love hearing Ben Affleck as Batman saying, "I will fucking kill you." I just I was it, like, it oh, was so God. amazing. I was like, Batman, just say the f word one more time. It was so <laughs> it was so awesome. Like. It sounds so stupid when someone tells you, hey, we're going we're gonna to have Batman just say the F word because it's cool. And you're like, that's forceful. And then you actually see it, you're like, actually, that's pretty dope. It's, it was great. And yeah. I really love it. I, had I think a great it's, one of those things, it's one of those things you have to experience. You can't really be told it beforehand. You have to like hear it. And you're like, oh, shit. Ooh. And then it's, it's Batman just waking up from a dream. And there's Martian Manhunter who's like, hey, I'm here too. But why didn't he help? And, and why are you going to cast that actor as Martian Manhunter? I've never liked that guy in any of his roles. He always plays the same motherfucker in every fucking movie. The general. Yeah, who's- I can agree with that. And honestly, man, I like. I don't dislike him. He did. He's doing a great job. He brings yeah, some good justice to it. I don't. I don't wish him ill will. But like Martian Manhunter, ah, it's a stretch too far for your, you know, talent. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would have much rather see somebody like... Uh, Not like Will Smith. Like, I don't know. Who's the like, guy that played the original War Machine? Uh, Colonel Rhodes. Oh, uh, Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard. I wouldn't mind him. He would have been great. You know who would be really cool? The guy, he's, he's a voice in Destiny. He's also in The, in the Wire. He plays, a, he plays a cop all the time. Black dude. What's his name? He's in John Wick. He's the... Um, uh, he's the guy... You've seen John Wick, right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen all of them. The guy in the uh, hotel. I'm talking who, about Lawrence Fishburne, are you? No, no, no. The guy who welcomes John Wick into the hotel. Um, oh, the guy who plays Caron? Yeah, involved? yeah. He would be a fantastic Martian Manhunter. I, I mean, agree with 100%. that. 100%. Have him be Martian Manhunter. Don't have this generic actor, no offense, play the same guy in every movie or show he's in as Martian Manhunter. Now, besides that, the design for Martian Manhunter, I don't like I, I definitely liked it. Yeah. I also liked the fact that there was two cameos of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I really, I love the scene where just Ben Affleck kind of wakes up at the end. And he's like, oh shit, that was crazy. I can't tell if that's real or not. He's yeah, saying dude, I love his reactions. I want him to have like a Nicolas Cage reaction next time he kind of wakes up from a dream. If he ever has, I don't know, a role in these movies again. Because like, you never know. You never know. With superhero movies, anything can happen. Agreed. That's, that's a very true statement. I mean, we're watching a movie that technically didn't exist. And now it does. <laughs> And, and I would say that would be the, the Snyder cut. That's what works. And for me, I, I'd give this movie an A minus A. Because you know, I've only seen it once in some re, uh, rewinds here and there. But I do plan on watching it again and again because it is, it is really good. You know, obviously, if you're not a fan of the, the four-hour timeline, I get that. Just take a break in between. But it is really good. Um, it is. 
And I think it flows a lot better than Man of Steel and Batman or Superman. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, yeah. Definitely. It's runtime uh, definitely is a little bit too much, though. I, 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 that's like my literal one complaint about this movie. But yeah, that was, that was our discussion for the Snyder Cut. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's really a moment in cinema right now, I think. And if you're watching this and you haven't seen it yet, I, and it, maybe this will be the tipping point to make you watch it, I wholeheartedly agree with your decision on that. Do exactly. It. Do it. Exactly. Definitely, definitely check it out. Don't because I, I went in this movie without any expectations. I wasn't. I knew it was not going to be worse than the, than the, the Joss Whedon thing. But I was predicting it to be a little bit choppy and messy as the, as the original cut of Batman vs Superman. And I was wrong. I was pleasantly wrong. Yeah, you guys should definitely check this movie out because it's fun. Yeah, uh, Chris, do you have any um, final thoughts before we depart? Um, watch the movie, man. Yeah. Watch also, work, work out to the soundtrack because it's dope. <laughs> yeah, uh, listen to the soundtrack. All right, guys. Well, Amazing. thank you, Chris, for joining me in this epic. And thank you guys for watching. And if you like this, click that like and subscribe button. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Leave a comment. Leave a smiley face. Do whatever you got to do. See you guys next time. Thanks for having me, man.